uh, press availability. Uh, every Wednesday we do this. We look forward to answering the questions that are pressing here in the state of Maine. And we can start with uh, AJ. I guess I'd start with the budget. Uh, obviously, we had some uh, some developments last night, appropriations. Uh, unclear at the moment in terms of what the Republican stance is on uh, consideration of, of new revenues. We, we seem to get the message from Kathleen Chase uh, last night that, uh, that they didn't want to discuss new revenue until more significant savings were achieved. Uh, obviously, this is a, a dance that the Appropriations Committee will go through, but time's running out. Uh, what's your take on these latest developments? So the Appropriations Committee is doing great work together. Last night was a very important discussion, and an honest discussion, about where we are looking at revenues. We look forward to our Republican colleagues answering that question, and we'll do it together. We know that we need to get a unanimous vote out of appropriations, and we need to pass uh, this in the House and the Senate with two-thirds majorities. And so this uh, revenue question will be on all of our minds over the next 36 to 54 hours. And it's a big question because what we know can't happen is the enormous property tax shift and hike that will happen to every mayor if we pass the governor's budget. And, and I'll just follow up. Continuing to say no is not an option at this point. Uh, in divided government, when we're looking for a unanimous report out of that committee, we all have to be coming to the table with good, honest, decent proposals. And I think the conversation last night that happened in the Appropriations Committee was a good example of that. I represented from the, the Democratic side, and we're really waiting for the Republicans to come forward with a reasonable proposal that really addresses uh, this gap that we have in the shift onto uh, property tax uh, uh, homeowners. So it's really, I think we're beginning to really have that uh, honest conversation, but we do need to have uh, partners in this as we uh, close the budget. The only Republican response we've seen other than uh, Representative Chase's was one that happened a few moments ago. Uh, Senator uh, Jackson was, was there to, uh, to uh, listen to some of it. I, I presume he's briefed uh, you on it. But um, there are, I guess, a, a group of Republicans who, who seem to be coming up with a, a fairly, uh, at least by comparative standards, kind of a radical proposal for, for providing new revenue. Uh, uh, have you had any chance to, to chew on that? Or? <laughs> can you wait just one second before you say just like, sorry. I'll just get on the talking points. <laughs> you can wind him up a little bit. some that have uh, wondered if this would ever happen. And I think you're starting to see the beginning. What I hope 
to, to see as a, a real um, commitment to bipartisan work from here to the end of our session, whether it relates to the budget or what we did today with redistricting. We got a very strong uh, bipartisan support uh, to pass that, agree on that, something that is very contentious in other states and always goes to court. We were able to sit down, find common ground, and really find a solution on redistricting. Uh, we engrossed the uh, energy bill today, another good piece of bipartisan work. I think that's going to start some, some really great momentum in this building. Uh, we had another great bipartisan vote on mining, another Representative Cave sponsored that bill, and we overrode a veto today. I think I really have to give credit to uh, Representative Fredette for standing up on the floor of the House saying why he's uh, uh, supporting the bill and not, not going to stand with the governor on this one. I uh, he certainly gained some, gained some of my respect today, and I think that, that this is the beginning of um, what I hope to see is real good bipartisan work all the way to the end. Do you think much of what we heard last night from Republicans on the Appropriations Committee was, was sort of a function of, of the fact that perhaps they had not quite expected um, um, Democratic leaders on the committee to, to move this question about revenues at that time. I, I know that when they were asking for, to engage in a, a discussion on it, was, those, those calls were, were frequently met with periods of silence. Uh, it was as if they, they really didn't know what to say because they hadn't had a chance really to talk to their own leadership about it. Do, do you think that's kind of where they are at this point? All I can say is that our um, Democratic members on appropriation understand that we have a very short period of time to get this work done. So there should be nothing that we can't talk about in public to get the job done. That's what they expect us to do. And I can't comment on whether they're ready or not ready, whether they're surprised or not surprised. But like we tell all of our members, our entire calendar is up every single day. You have to be prepared to do the work. We need to get out by June 19th. We, we must pass this budget. And so uh, I look forward to you know, very, very good conversations with our Republican leaders and making sure that we support our members on appropriations you know, every step of the way to the finish line. Now tomorrow, I believe that you'll be taking up LD 1066 at that time, the, the Medicaid expansion bill, correct? In the Senate? Uh, it's, it's on our unfinished business, yes. And, and uh, I just, where are we, uh, do you think, at this moment on that particular issue? I, I, the governor, I think, put out a, a press release the other, late, the other day uh, saying that he, he didn't really want to talk about this until other other underserved members, uh, main residents, are, uh, are considered for, uh, for health care. So I think across this building, seeing what we learned uh, when we put both bills together from our Republican colleagues, we have made adjustments made adjustments in committee. We're going to make adjustments in the state senate. And those adjustments, meaning amendments, will head down to the House. I think across this building, there are many people very interested in looking at how we do the right thing for Maine, how we expand health care for 70,000 people, how we do this uh, so that the hospitals can drive down costs. And I think it's very exciting. It goes back to what Speaker Eve said earlier, the bipartisan work that we're doing is really starting to illustrate itself across this building. And that's what Mainers expect us to do, to work with our colleagues across the aisle, compromise, make sure that we get things done to address the big issues. And so I know when this bill comes up, uh, we're going to have a, a, a good discussion. Um, and we've listened to our Republican uh, colleagues, and I think we're going to be adding uh, amendments that will make the bill better. So is there an amendment in the, in the works that possibly could address some of uh, these points that the governor uh, made in, in, in his press release yesterday? So as far as the governor's uh, press release, um, we're trying to understand it. I mean, he put a number of 3,100 people. We don't understand what this population exists. We all know that Section 21 and 29, you know, there's around 1,200 you know, folks on that, and they're on a waiting list. And we'd like, we want to address those members of Maine We'd like to address the others that he's talking about. We need to know more information. But if he wants to put together a bill that he can pay for to address the 3,100 people on a waiting list, we Speaker Eves and I would love to look at that. We'd love to work with this commissioner. We'd love to work with our public and colleagues to get that done. We agree that this waiting list is too long and we need to address it. But you just can't put out a press release with no details and say, well, don't do this until you do this. Well, please give us some more information. You're the governor of the state of Maine. You have plenty of staff. Put a reasonable proposal on the table, and we will react to it. And I'd just like to say, I mean, I don't 
really care so much what the governor has to say because he's always moving the goalposts. If we did fund those 3,100 people, he's never going to want to accept uh, expansion. Uh, for whatever reason, he's pulled the ladder up behind himself. Uh, he's not in, uh, interested in helping these people out, and I think he's losing his death grip on on uh, some of the people uh, on the other side of the aisle. I think people are starting to realize that this is good for the state of Maine. We can change the, the, the deal. I mean, we're a small state. Uh, California, New Jersey, uh, Florida has all accepted this. Uh, you know, why would the federal government change change the deal for Maine? And plus, the, the deal is good for Maine. So, I mean, I, the governor never, if we had a thousand years, 100% the governor would never accept this. And just uh, very quickly add that um, the question around where things stand, where I would, the assessment that I have is that momentum is building, there's enthusiasm growing, both in the House and the Senate with their Republican colleagues, we're having really honest, decent conversations. We're making concessions, we're really listening, and uh, I really think that we can uh, do something really significant for the state of Maine. Other questions? You covered everything I was going to ask. <laughs> well, AJ is very thorough. <laughs> he is indeed. He is indeed. <laughs>